Good morning and welcome to our session on cell supply. Can anyone just give me a signal if we're ready to start? We're ready to rock and roll. Great, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to your session on cell supply in Asia. My name is John Butterworth from IRC and I'm welcoming you to this session in the name of 10 different organizations which have organized it and you can you can find those details um, here in the Pathable platform. Just bear with me a moment. So just a few technical details. We have a, a, a chat box here in, uh, here in the Pathable platform. And as a first step, we invite you to write down the name of your organization so that we can see who is here with us. Later, we'll be using that chat, chat box for interaction during the session. So that's really important. Also, if you want to speak during the session, you'll need to be signed into your Zoom account. Uh, and there, uh, you'll be able to, uh, if you log in there, you'll be able to speak. Apologies, Kirsten, can you take over? My, my screen is crashing here. Hi, I'm sorry about that. John's got an, an internet connection that's a little bit wobbly at the moment. So um, yeah, please, just if you could pop in your um, name and your organization and which country you're in, that would be great. We can get a feel for, for who's here today. Um, the session really has been organized to share experiences about self-supply with you and with our great panel of, of speakers here. And um, it's really organized to, to reflect on the fact that self-supply is a complementary solution that strengthens resilience and to really learn about the amazing things that have been happening in Asia. So we're going to inter Let me close my window. I'm also back now, Kirsten. If you All right, you, you carry on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a good example of how to start. So, we're yeah. going to introduce you in the session to the concepts of self-supply. We've got case studies and we're going to hear from you. And without more ado, therefore, let's get started. And we're going to hear from Sally Sutton, a lady with four decades of experience on this topic, and who's just written a book about it. And she's going to be inter inter interviewed here by Kirsten. Um, and then after this short clip, we'll be hearing from Tim Foster from the University of Sydney. And he's going to set the scene on self-supply in Asia. You know, you've just written this fantastic book on self-supply, which is a, a delight to read and, and full of interesting material. But I want to ask you a kind of personal question. And that's, what's your most memorable observation of self-supply or observations of self-supply? Uh, that's a difficult one, but because the problem is there are so many, but I think it, it's, it's partly just the scale of it. It's the fact that you come across it everywhere in the world. Um, you know, I'm just as likely to find it in, in, in the United States or in Ireland as I am in um, Zambia or Indonesia. So it's more of an amalgam rather than a particular incident or a particular place. Yeah, no, thanks. The, yeah, the, the scale, the fact that it's almost ubiquitous Yes, and, and I think, I mean, there are some countries about which we don't know because there's no data for them, such as China and Russia to some degree, but I think that they too probably exhibit very much the same characteristics. Yeah, okay, okay. And kind of, you know, for, for those of us here today who, who are not so familiar with what self-supply is, how would you describe it in a nutshell? What is it? Well, it's, it's basically the self-financing of the provision of any service. So it could be electricity or it could be sanitation or in, in the case of most of the book, it's um, talking mainly about water, but with a little bit of reference also to sanitation. So it's, it's basically where people are providing their own supply 
and because they're usually doing it from only within their own means, it, it tends to happen in small steps. So you progress, you progress up a sort of ladder of service delivery um, over time as, as the economy of the household improves. Okay, now that, that's clear. And, and, and why is it so important that self-supply is considered? Why does it matter? Um, I think from two points of view. One is that, the, that so many people who at present have no alternative um, source uh, and, and also that they tend to value it so much themselves. So I think it has the opportunity to add considerably to the provision of water at, at standards which are at least basic or even safely managed. Just to add to that, I mean, I think as we're now looking more and more in, in, the, in the SDG aims, we're looking more and more at having on-premises supplies. And these supplies, the one in seven, are already on-premises and, and the vast majority of them are in fact improved. Um, that doesn't mean that they haven't got plenty of scope for further improvement and upgrading. But certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, it's um, over half of rural and about 89% of urban self-supply, which is improved. And somewhere like South Asia, where it's very much more developed and even more people involved, um, nearly all of the supplies are at a level which counts as improved, but again, has lots of room for um, further upgrading and reaching higher service levels. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks for bringing in that point about being at the home. You're really talking about people who have invested in services that are at their own premises already. Yes, and I think particularly convenience is probably the, the most important stimulant to people investing in their own water supply anywhere. Yeah. Um, so it, it's that which is driving people to invest millions on their own, which is often among the poorest um, members of, of the society. Yeah, no, thank you. And I mean, you're, you're clearly very passionate about this topic and you've spent a long time, many hours and weeks and months writing this book. And so you're, you're a credible book. What, what do you want that book to achieve? Well, I, I think I really want it to achieve a, a, a level of understanding among people, because at the moment it's, it's so not recognised as something that's important and it has so much to offer. So I think it needs to firstly sort of get people understanding more what already exists that they've never really looked at. But then I think it also needs the development in each country of systems which support self-supply to do a better job. And that is almost totally missing worldwide. I mean, to a small degree in high income countries, there is some level of grants or loans, but generally very little. And the regulation is almost self-regulation. It's, it's the households who are expected to check that their water's all right um, and, and to report if they um, feel that they're getting ill from the water that they've got and so on. And in, in a lower income country, there's really no, uh, no inventories. There's no way of knowing how many such systems there are on the ground or where they are on the ground. And until that is available, uh, it's very difficult to, to plan alongside it and, and to, be, to be doing planning of, of um, water supplies in a country without any knowledge of what already exists within um, households and to which they, they um, with which they, have such a, a high value that they give to it, I, I think means that, that 
it makes it very difficult for other systems to be as sustainable as they should be. So it it requires really a, a, an integrating of self supply into the overall picture of the sector, and then working out within each um, sort of political and hydrogeological and cultural setting how the support to that can be most cost effectively carried out. Generally, alongside the community water supply systems that already exist and the support services which um, they depend on. Thank you very much, Sally, there. And now I'm going to hand over to the live Kirsten Denner, who's going to be our facilitator for the rest of this session. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and then, then Tim. It is you, Kirsten. Take it away, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. And thanks a lot, Sally. Um, and thanks to all of our co-hosts. We've got a big group organizing this. Um, let me hand over to Tim. Tim, you've got some really interesting information to share with us, I think, about self-supply in Asia. So over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, yeah, so in, in order to set the scene for today's discussion, um, I just wanted to briefly touch on the extent of self-supply um, in Asia uh, and the Pacific. Um, and uh, I guess the first thing is to say that um, as has already been mentioned, self-supply is ubiquitous across um, Asia and the Pacific. Um, so um, based on analysis of nationally representative um, surveys um, across the region, um, uh, we've estimated around one in three households um, self-supply their drinking water. Um, and that's equivalent to around 770 or 780 million people across the region um, self-supplying their drink, drinking water. Uh, and when you consider um, secondary sources uh, used for other domestic purposes, um, this number increases to uh, over 850 million uh, and perhaps even over 1 billion people when you um, consider uh, countries such as China where, where, where data is, is scant. Um, so you can see here in this slide um, that's presented at the moment, uh, country level rates of self-supply vary um, quite significantly. Um, from no self-supply at all um, through to countries where uh, almost the entire population practice self-supply. Um, around 90% of the region's um, self-supplying households can be found in just five countries. So you can see that the, the pie graph on the right, um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, and Indonesia. Um, and then when you add in Vietnam into the mix there too, that accounts for about 90% of self-supplying households. Um, and as I guess many people would expect, uh, self-supply is more common in rural areas. Um, so we estimate around 38% of households in rural areas across the region self-supply their drinking water um, as compared to about 21% in urban areas. Though there are some exceptions with countries such as Afghanistan and, and Papua New Guinea where self-supply is actually more common in, in urban areas than rural areas. Um, and then the number of um, people relying on self-supply is growing by about nine to 10 million people um, a year. Um, and so that suggests that the household investment that's going into these systems is, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, annually. Um, so Rania, if we can just move to the next slide, um, which uh, illustrates that the forms of self-supply uh, or the types of self-supply that are found across the region. Um, and they really do vary from country to country and, and even from region to region. Um, so groundwater self-supply dominates and, and that's really driven by the high number of tube wells in, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, however, in the Pacific, um, we find around, um, uh, we find rainwater collection is really the, the more common mode of self-supply. Um, but I think a really important point is that about 95% of uh, self-supply sources are actually considered uh, improved. Um, so I'll stop there and, and, and hand back to you, Kirsten. Great, no, thanks a lot, Tim. You're, you're great at collecting all this information on and kind of, yeah, whether it's functionality or on numbers of self-supply. So yeah, really interesting data. Let's come to some stories now. So I'm gonna to go to Thailand first, um, really the specific experiences of, of self-supply. And uh, Matthias, you actually went to Thailand 
and you documented self-supply experience. So tell us a little bit more about Thailand. Yes, thank you. We at RWSN, we looked at Thailand because it's a case where really self-supply went mainstream and to tens of millions of people. So that's why we documented a bit that experience. And the one factor that I would like to highlight now is really the importance of government. The, in the two aspects I would like to highlight in terms of government involvement, one is policy setting and the other one is capacity building. Policy setting, in the case of Thailand, it was crucial to have a clear and simple policy and to maintain that over a very long time, talking about decades, so that all the actors in the field can align to that policy. Um, we're talking about dozens of actors, even in government, but also private sector, NGOs, and everyone else. So it's important to maintain that enabling policy over a long time. And the other aspect I would like to mention is capacity building. The initiative of promoting rainwater harvesting in Thailand actually started as a job creation program in the 80s. And thousands of people were trained. Um, after a while, and after government subsidies ran out, these people actually became active as private sector um, entrepreneurs. And they went on building these rainwater tanks for decades and really literally millions of these tanks were built thanks to the capacity built by the government initiative. Those are the two aspects I would like to highlight, clear and stable policies over time and capacity building by government. Back to you. Thank you, Matthias. Great, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got another experience from Asia. This time it's from Bangladesh. Um, so Tara, Tell us what flavor of self-supply water aid has been supporting in Bangladesh. Hi, thanks, Kirsten. So yeah, as we've already heard um, from Tim, self-supply is very widespread in Bangladesh, which is what I'm gonna talk about. And there's over 10 million households there estimated to have their own hand pumps. And data from the 2019 Glass Report is now indicating that household investments in self-supply in Bangladesh exceed tariff payments for, dr for drinking water. And the other factor is that microfinance loans for income generating activities are really commonly used in Bangladesh. So WaterAid Bangladesh combined these two facts to partner together with microfinance providers to provide wash, water sanitation, hygiene, microfinance loans to rural households. So these loans meant that a percentage of the loan could be used to install or upgrade water or sanitation infrastructure. And then the rest of it could be used for income generation to pay off the loan. And then WaterAid supported the demand um, to generate demand for these loans through community awareness activities on benefits of improved wash. And this has been really successful and WaterAid Bangladesh are now incorporating this into more of their programs going forward. So we're excited to see how it can scale. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks a lot, Tara. Um, and just to, to the audience, we have about 60 people here, 60 people plus the organizers and, and facilitators and presenters. If you have questions, thoughts, reflections, please feel free to post them in the Pathable chat and um, then we can get our que your questions to our great set of panelists here. Um, but we've got another example from Bangladesh first. I'd like to invite Abu Aslam of water.org to really share your experiences of promoting self-supply in Bangladesh. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. So I would like to highlight our experiences, especially in relation to uh, micro lending for water supply in Bangladesh. So as we all might know, the growth of microfinance institutions in access to credit uh, by the poor took place in several distinct phases over the last three decades in Bangladesh. So microfinance is playing a critical role in household being able to create and maintain their water supply. Access to water and sanitation services has been doing under a system that can largely be classified and, uh, uh, as one focused on self-supply, particularly in rural areas. So there is a very powerful word, small loans, big impacts. So what are the dog and international nonprofit organizations initially started its journey with the vision of increasing water financing through microcredit by working directly with selected microfinance uh, institutions taking uh, advantage of the already established businesses uh, uh, market structures in Bangladesh. So we have been supporting the scaling of uh, water supply financing in particular through 
our flagship integrated approach called um, water credit model program since 2015. So in the last five years, we were able to positively impact the lives of uh, 4.15 uh, million people in Bangladesh through the water credit program, where we have mobilized uh, uh, 266.34 million US dollar and the average loan size is uh, 320 US dollar. The remor remarkable uh, re repayment rate is 98%. So the ultimate beneficiaries of the program are the poor household, where 90% of our borrowers live in rural areas. The water options that our clients are able, uh, availing are, are shallow hand tip oil, ring tip oil, deep tip oil, uh, pipe water supply, rainwater harvesting, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the ongoing water credit program is well accepted by the stakeholders and expanding rapidly now the program has been replicating by all the large MFIs, including the Apex organizations and other financial institutions. So in the, in the last year, even during the COVID situation, our program growth rate has been remarkable, which is providing the permanent solutions of water crisis through self-supply uh, uh, models. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And, and for those of you who are, who are joining this group, you can see we've got a group of absolutely passionate people about self-supply and, and what it can do here. And what's fascinating listening to all of you is just the different vignettes, the government, the private sector, the households, the, the microfinance organisations, as you're bringing all of these different aspects together. But let's carry on. Let's, we're going to move to Indonesia now and really reflect more on the urban self-supply. So Dr. Cindy Praidi of the University of Indonesia. Let's hear from you, Cindy. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. And um, building on what, uh, on what Tim mentioned, so as part of a research project funded by the Australian government's Water for Women Fund, we at Universitas Indonesia and UTS investigated how self-supply plays a critical role in mostly urban Indonesia. So approximately 80 million of the urban population rely on private well, which is actually more than double the number relying on pipe connection. So this is a big number. And we focused on two cities, Bekasi and Metro, and based on a survey that we conducted of 600 households, our research has found that E. coli actually um, is found in around two thirds of self-supply sources with source protection being a key determinant of water quality. This is a, a big concern, of course, but however, a high proportion of those households boil their water prior to drinking. And we have observed that um, actually substantial improvement in self-supply water quality by the time it is at their point of use. We have also found that urban self-supply is often a highly reliable source of water with service continuity substantially better than utility supplied pipe services. So these findings underline not only the risks that can be posed uh, through self-supply, but also the benefit of it. So we understand why it's widely used. So back to you, Kristen. Thank you very much, Cindy. That's great. Um, we've got another three nuggets from our great presenters, and then we're going to open up for a bit more of a discussion with, with you, with the audience. Um, let me hand over now to Noor Aisa. Nas Nas Nasution from the, um, the Directorate of Housing and Settlements in Indonesia. Over to you. Thank you, Kristen. So building up uh, with Cindy and also Tim mentioned professionally, improving access to safely managed water is one of our key development priorities for the uh, for Bapanas, for the government of Indonesia. And of course, it's part of our commitment for the SDG 2013. Despite significant progress that uh, we have been made in improving access to improve and safely manage water, but we realize that actually uh, the contribution of pipe water is only accounted for 20%. Uh, up to, uh, while our our improved access already achieved 90%. So it's actually only cover 50 million people, the pipe water. And we realize also the poor drinking water quality uh, remains a persistent problem here in Indonesia. And then uh, to kind of like gather the, the evidence on how poor uh, our drinking water quality, we also conducted a study together with Ministry of Health. Uh, and we see that actually our safely managed water, drinking water is only achieved uh, 12%. So as the government, of course, we see there are challenges to improve access to safely managed water since most of our system is actually non-pipe. 
which is of course is mainly or is self supply and 90% of our communities also rely on septic tank or pit latrines so based on those conditions we ask support from UTS and new EI cases around uh, 2019 or 2018 to conduct a study to analyze uh, our existing condition uh, of safely managed water here in Indonesia especially for the urban household that uh, rely on self supply mainly boreholes and well and we want to see like how it's its availability and on it. We want to have an evidence base to see how far we can rely on these systems for achieving safely managed water. Furthermore, we also want to know that what step toward that we need to develop uh, in terms of policy, in terms of capacity, whether or not we need to improve improve the condition of self-supply, or maybe we need to consider to shift uh, a sifting strategy development where we need to change our scenario from self-supply to pipe water. So that's actually the, the foundation, the, the questions that we, we, we already asked. Uh, this study that uh, done by UTS and UI is also one of, among one of our initiatives here in Indonesia, since we also have uh, developing a number of initiatives to, to, to see how we can achieve the SDG 2013, such as uh, uh, we, we develop the roadmap for water safe zone, reducing non-revenue water, water safety plan, and of, of course the water quality monitoring. So, uh, and uh, as an umbrella of those uh, initiative is actually the roadmap to safely manage water. So I think the study of this self supply will become an evidence, an important part to our development of the SDG strategy, how uh, it also can be used for evidence-based advocacy material. Since uh, as mentioned before, not many actors realize that actually uh, the majority of people still rely on self-supply and how actually government need to take, uh, to take step forward to manage this self-supply. Back to you, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's so much that you're doing. It's, oh, it's fascinating. That's great to hear. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of interesting questions and ideas coming um, from the audience now. So let's go to our second last speaker, which is um, really on the question of human rights, you know, human rights, leave no one behind. These are the big legal and political drivers of our time internationally. Um, Jenny, you've been working on this issue of human rights and groundwater, especially for over a decade now. Um, can you shed some light on human rights issues or even concerns that you might have about self-supply? Over to you, Jenny. Thank you and hello everyone. Uh, so we know that the dependence on groundwater is um, growing, increasing globally. And uh, Tim mentioned that we more often see this in rural areas, but we actually do see an increase also in urban areas where people are not adequately supplied with other means. Um, I grew up being self-supplied in the countryside, but through my research, I have seen um, this dependence on wells and boreholes in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And there is an interesting connection between the self-supply and the groundwater reliance and uh, the human rights to water and sanitation and other human rights. Um, and under the international human rights law, it actually seems as if this framework points to self-supply being the norm. And that only as a last resort, if households cannot reasonably be expected to provide for themselves, must the state go in and directly distribute water. There is a general concern, which we have heard about. Cindy mentioned uh, the risk of E. coli. So uh, the quality of the drinking water and the user's awareness and knowledge about the safety of their drinking water, um, that is something where we also see that under the human rights uh, framework, the state has an obligation to ensure everyone's physical and mental health and to leave no one behind. And so what the state is obliged to do there is to give clear and user-friendly advice on, for instance, uh, treatment and point source protection. Thank you. Over. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Wonderful. Um, now, our last, but by no means least, um, we're going to close with um, some words from, from Barbara Van Koppen from the International Water Management Institute. Um, you know, let's you think much broader than drinking water. So let's hear from you, drinking water, irrigation water, other water supplies. 
Over to you, Barbara. Thanks, uh, Kerstin. Yeah, no, there are two inter interesting uh, lessons learned in the irrigation sector. And the first is that um, self-supply, well, called farmer-led irrigation development, is much more widespread than uh, government-financed irrigation systems. And it's also more sustainable. And a second lesson is that when farmers have their pipes and pumps um, near or at their homesteads, they use it for multiple uses. They use it for irrigation and domestic uses and livestock and other productive uses. So this brings health, convenience, and nut better nutrition, and it gives income. And that income can then be reinvested in, uh, in better uh, infrastructure. In Nepal, Nepal is a champion in that regard. They have um, the donors, the NGOs, the government has promoted this multiple use services, MUS, MUS, for two decades now to, yeah, to gain all these benefits. But elsewhere as well, in, in Africa, South Africa, Ethiopia, many other countries, Latin America, we see um, approaches that generate really these many benefits so achieving many SDGs. Now, and the last lesson, not from the irrigation, but really the water resources allocation, not the service, the, the infrastructure, but the resource. An interesting lesson there is that um, domestic uses generally or, already have a priority in most uh, water laws, uh, but it should be better enforced. And then, of course, as Jenny says, the human rights that water resources used for self-supply for productive users, the right to food should be equally, equally prioritized. These were the lessons learned elsewhere. Thank you, thanks a lot, Barbara. And um, as you can hear, I mean, that's, we've, been, we've heard, basically you've heard from 10 self-supply champions, you used the word champion, so I'll, I'll steal that word from you. Um, passion for self-supply, reflection of the reality of self-supply, and now we'd really like to hear from the audience, your thoughts, your ideas, your questions to the panel, challenges that you have, things that you're concerned about. And I'm going to start with a question that's already come in, um, a question from Fabio Fussi. And I'm going to put this question to you, Abu. Um, and Fabio says, it's interesting to see the extent of, of self-supply in Bangladesh. And could you perhaps give some information regarding the type of wells that are used for self-supply? compared to those that are supplying water for public network, and also some indications about the arsenic issue um, with self-supply groundwater in Bangladesh. So over to you, Abu. Thank you so much, thank you. So uh, as you know, the water, uh, water options that um, our clients are availing here, uh, the shallow hand tea oil, there are ring oil with hand pump, deep tea oils, uh, there are pipetted supply, uh, that is the water supply con connection, household wa water um, connection, water quality improvements, rainwater harvesting, spring casement, and also uh, borehole with, with the overhand, overhead pump. So mostly this kind of um, water options are availing uh, by our, our uh, clients. So on the arsenic, as you know, arsenic contamination in groundwater in Bangladesh is, is, is called an environmental and social disaster. So there are like, you know, uh, many reasons the, the experts are um, here to finally, uh, you know, uh, find it out the one cause, there are multiple causes, but the arsenic contamination is increasing day by day, especially uh, uh, the water, as the water is being, uh, taken up um, so th th there are some like you know the, the communications saying from the government side too so mostly um, uh, we are trying to use the water uh, supply system so that the mass water will not be you know drawn up uh, from the mass people from the mass areas so uh, and you know like you know there are huge challenges, there are huge adverses, like you know, the effects of arsenic to human health. So on that many ways, we are yet to address all those challenges, but um, we including the government and our other other uh, development stakeholders, we are working to address 
um, um, hopefully we'll be able to reduce the, the causes of arsenic in groundwater connection. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive response there. I have a question that's coming from Henk, Henk um, Holslag, and I'm going to, I think, put it to you, Isa. Um, it's around water quality, and you talked quite a lot about water quality. Um, Henk points out that household water filters can make water safe to drink. And I'm just wondering if you have any experience or knowledge about the use of household water filters in, in, in your context. And anybody else for the panel, if you'd like to respond to that question, please pop your hand up. But, but first, over to you. Yeah, uh, actually, as a government, we, uh, we, that's one of our strategy to provide household, household water filter, but not yet really kind of like a strong one that we, we, we encourage people to use that because uh, before SDG especially, we, we still focusing on how people have a improved water on their premises. Uh, but now, as we move forward to the safely managed water, we've been thinking about like making this kind of like filters or other treatment in households, especially for those who still rely on non-pipe system, to to, to so so they uh, could uh, ensure that the quality of water is uh, is safe uh, um, safely to 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 drink. So uh, we see that. Uh, there is a quality improvement in the household that use the filter. But again, since it is not kind of like a national strategy, uh, we only kind of like uh, use it and implement it in some areas, like in the one of the province in West Java. So we, I cannot say much more on that, but we are, we've been thinking that we need to introduce that kind of strategy to achieve the, the, the SDG school. Great, Hopefully. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank, thank you very much. And Cindy, you've also got something to say on this. So over to you. Hi, thank you, Kristin. Um, maybe I'd like to add also to what Aisha uh, mentioned. Um, so uh, from our survey, we found that almost 99% are actually uh, boiling their water. There's a small amount uh, who's chlorinating their water. But um, at least within our, our samples, almost uh, virtually no household use filters. So uh, as Aisha also mentioned, it's not something very common. Um, I think there's also that convenience side and also the um, traditional side because boiling water is, is something that's been handed uh, from their ancestors. Uh, so they've been boiling water uh, from their parents, from, from their grandparents, or, so there's that aspect. Um, and also there's uh, the convenience side. So even though boiling water is, is less convenient, I think most households, they would either use self-supply and then boil their water, or they would otherwise just um, use uh, bottled water or refilled water. That's also uh, what we found. Uh, in many households and like it's among Tim's uh, findings that uh, many households actually use self-supply for secondary water source, but their primary water source uh, are actually um, bottled or refilled water. So there's that convenience side as well. So there's um, on the one hand that the traditional uh, culture and also on the other hand, uh, this consumerism and uh, like another type of uh, water source. Um, which is why I think uh, the filter is not very well uh, uptaken in, in the households. Yeah, over to you, Kristin. No, thank, thank you very much for enlightening us. It's fascinating. Um, Jenny, you've also got something to say on this topic. Yes, um, I actually want to echo a lot of what uh, Cindy said uh, that I've seen in my own research that um, a lot of the users, they may have a certain awareness, uh, but they go very much by um, the taste of the water. And in my um, interviews and surveys, I hear uh, responses such as, no, we don't treat the water, but we use the same stories every time and we know from others whether it is safe or not. Uh, but indeed, uh, for very many people, whether uh, we're talking about low income um, areas or high income areas, um, the self-supply water is uh, often not used for direct drinking. It might be used for cooking, but bottled water, sachet water and so on. 
uh, could be the main source. But it really depends on the household and the individuals and their level of, of awareness and knowledge, education and so on. So there is a lot that the state and organizations and researchers such as we can go over. Thanks a lot, Jenny. And before we come to our next two questions, a very good question for you, Barbara. I'll come to you next. But I'd like to go to the um, poll first. So, Ranier, could you help us with this poll? This is the first time we're doing this, so it's a bit exciting. It, it should be a, in a pathable platform. It should be visible for everyone, the poll. Okay. Next to the chat window, there's a section for polls, and then you can uh, see the question there. Right, so I'm going to kind of speak the question out, and then are you going to beam the response onto the screen? Um, uh, yeah, once the responses are there, I should great. be able to <laughs> Thanks a lot. So question to you, you know, why do you think that self-supply is important for water supplies in Asia, in one word? Why is it important? Um, we assume that we think it is important, but let's look at the reasons. So if you can pop that, your responses there in Pathable. Um, and let's see what we have coming up. I'm now in the wrong place in Pathable. <laughs> there are some responses, so I'll, I'll try right. to show them on the yeah, screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the wrong place in Pathable. <laughs> so I'll let you beam the response up. So the question again is, in one word, why do you think that self-supply is important for water supplies in Asia? Resilience, access, independence, universal. Maybe you can keep putting your answers in, you can have some time to think about it and we'll carry on with the questions. Um, but please feel free also to be kind of um, provocative, um, if you if you want to be, we're really happy to, to hear different perspectives and have an open discussion. So Barbara, we've got a question for you from Ingeborg Kluckert from IRC. And she points yeah. out that you were saying that farmer led irrigation is more sustainable than government led irrigation. And um, she says, well, this is a bit counterintuitive, considering that in many countries, groundwater levels um, are actually dropping quite fast as farmers extract too much groundwater. So, you know, can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by sustainability? Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, in, uh, yeah, an excellent question, re really about the third lesson that I talked about, about the water resources. So um, I keep differentiating between the service, the infrastructure um, and the resource. So for the, the sustainability, I talked about was about the infrastructure, the operation and maintenance problems, the build, the rebuild, the build, neglect, rebuild uh, problem that is very similar in the irrigation sector as in the, uh, what I, the wash uh, sector. So the sustainability is about that uh, issue. For the water resources, um, first of all, we, uh, we talk about both uh, surface water and groundwater and conjunctive management. The large scale uh, gravity systems in Asia, for example, India, Pakistan, uh, replenish the groundwater and, the, and then the farmers, they, they have their own pump to get the water from, uh, yeah, from the aquifers. But it is conjunctive management of surface and groundwater. We, we can't differentiate water, uh, water is water. And the, um, well, there are many areas where there is, well, where the, water, the groundwater is replenished next year. Uh, so, but there is a period of, of uh, drawdown, of course. Um, but the real competition is between the, in the same household. They need uh, water for their farm, uh, for irrigation, but they also need water for domestic uses. So, it, it, um, the, the, the real issues of the redistribution and the allocation of the water resources is becoming very, very uh, visible now. Um, and that's also why we really have to start thinking, even in a community, usually there are customary arrangements, but even in a community, um, how are communities managing the drawdown 
for the hand pumps. The hand pumps don't get water anymore when the same household is going to have a small uh, maybe solar pump for, for irrigation. And that's where the I think the, the human rights issues, the, the notions of what do we want uh, the water resources to be useful uh, for are so vital. And of course, the inequalities in South Africa, for example, the Gini coefficient is 0.96. Very few users use most of the water resources. So, yeah, by really looking at the realities on the ground, self-supply, farmland irrigation, the, the, the distribution issues for the water resources come out. And that's a matter of values. It, yeah. I hope it answers a bit, but it is a big issue. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And if you want to carry on with that topic, please keep writing in the, the Pathable chat. Um, we can have some more discussion there. I've got a question here from Lamessa and a question to, to Abu. Lamessa would like to just know a little bit more about water.org's experience with self-supply loans. So over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure to share. <laughs> so as I, uh, you know, shared um, in my one minute uh, speech earlier, like um, we have a tremendous experiences. So especially uh, uh, we are using the already established platform with the microfinance institutions. So nowadays our program is not only limited with the microfinance institutions, but also with the other uh, existing platforms like the financial institutions, as I mentioned, like the Apex organizations, so the other development organizations, like, uh, so what we are doing, especially through our flagship program called Water Credit Program, so we are um, trying to onboard the financial institutions to take another initiative for, um, for many steaming, um, Another component of their overall portfolio is calling like water supply programs. So in, in uh, through that kind of water supply programs, especially the borrowers are, are able to take the, uh, the, the finance for uh, fulfilling their uh, need of the water. And it is very permanent, it is sustainable. And on the other hand, for the institution side, um, it is proving, it has been proving that this is very profitable too. So, and I mentioned, especially during this COVID, so that is not only helping our clients uh, uh, related to like, you know, the, again, um, hygiene, hand washing, and also the drinking water. On the other hand, the repayment rate is remarkable than, than regular other loan products, for example. So in that very way, it is proved that this self-supply model, especially for, for water, Financing is really helpful on the other hand, as well as this is sustainable and profitable for the organizations too. Uh, so right now our program is expanding and uh, um, so far uh, the program is going um, every corner of the country. So as a whole, um, uh, we have a very positive results and um, very success cases in our hand in Bangladesh and as well as some other countries where water.org especially is operating. Over. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's fascinating and great to hear that you're, you know, really spreading to so many areas and giving so many people the opportunity to improve their water supplies. Um, I hear that there's some more poll answers up. Rainier, do you want to share the poll with us? Oh, great. I made a snap snapshot, so I think in this way it's easier. Yeah, that's lovely. So we have resilience, gaps, equity, access as the big issues, but also a lot of other important aspects, cost, equal, diversity, specific independence, a oh, great scarcity. Yeah, but really this resilience, access, equity coming out very strongly, but some other really important points as well. Wonderful, great. Let me come back to the questions. I have a question for you, Tim. Uh, I think you're the, probably the best person to answer this question, but if anybody else wants to respond from the panel, please put your hand up. We'll try to have this question and then one more before we close. So Tim, this question is from Arco van der Thurn. Um, Self-supply is, uh, is becoming a reliable alternative to utility water. 
but how is maintenance arranged? Who repairs the facility at household level and what are the institutional arrangements around self-supply maintenance? So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Kirsten, and, and thanks for the, for the question. Um, I think, um, without wanting to, to generalise, I think generally speaking with self-supply, the, the operation maintenance um, rests with the household in terms of overall responsibility. Um, you know, obviously, depending on the, the nature of the water supply system, they, they may need some um, external assistance in terms of conducting repairs or rehabilitation. Um, and, and that's, I would say, more often than not through, through the private sector, whether it's formal um, or informal. I think one of the, um, in my view, one of the um, real advantages of self-supply is that it does tend to be um, more reliable um, and the operation maintenance is often, um, I guess, uh, performed to a higher level than um, uh, other uh, systems. I, I think that there's a little bit of evidence around that um, with repair times being a bit faster. And I, I think um, that may be in part because the systems may be lower tech than, than alternative sources, but also because the incentives um, are aligned and even the collective action challenges are different. So self-organisation within our household is, is probably a lot easier than self-organisation at a, a community level, for example, particularly you know, in, in rural areas. Um, so I, I think there are some, some um, upsides in terms of operation maintenance, but in terms of the actual arrangements, I'd say it's the households that, that are responsible and often they would require some sort of um, support from the private sector, um, whether it's formal or informal. Thank you, thank you very much, Tim. Oh gosh, a big question just popped into my chat. <laughs> oh, wow, this is great. The discussion is just getting to go. We don't have a lot of time, but let's see if we can get as many questions as possible. Um, I'm gonna put a question back to you, Cindy. It's from Lemesa again, and it's asking um, at, for India and for, for Bangladesh and for Indonesia, if there are any strategies to accelerate household sanitation in parallel with household self-supply. So I'll pop this question to you, Cindy, if you if you have any kind of response on that. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for that. Um, I'll maybe try to answer. Uh, I don't know, maybe if, if Aisha also have uh, something to say uh, on this. Uh, the, it's been on, on our discussion that it's uh, probably better to choose whether we want to focus on self-supply and then, um, and then maybe the sanitation wise, uh, we can do more decentralized um, uh, or centralized uh, treatments. Um, but uh, I think from, from at least from what uh, I observe and also from like all the documents lined up, um, there are more efforts on, on water supply than uh, on sanitation. Um, I think it's the, almost the same as uh, as water supply that the sanitation side, um, there's been uh, a lot of efforts in the last decades, uh, funding for feasibility studies on centralized um, um, wastewater treatment, which but hasn't taken place. And so now uh, the government is looking more towards uh, decentralized uh, or community-based you know, sanitation systems. Um, I think that's from, at least from my side that I know, or maybe uh, Aisha would like to add, or I'll give it back to you, Kristen. Yeah, Aisha, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, we now also uh, try to find the evidence base for the the rela uh, relationship between house uh, household that use on site system and also non pipe, and uh, uh, we want to know more based on that evidence. We see that actually uh, the contamination, the level of contamination of for household that use non pipe and on site is higher, uh, but we still want to. Uh, try to develop kind of like strategy if for the household with the on-site system it is better for them to move to the the, the, the centralized systems or maybe the uh, the, the non-pipe system for the water should be moved to the pipe system it's something like questions uh, for for now uh 
integrated strategy between sanitation and water supply is something also that we felt missing. We still kind of like talk about how to improve non-pipe to pipe and uh, decentralized to centralized, but how actually these two strategy need to be combined or uh, co-developed. It's something that actually uh, one of our uh, questions uh, in here in Indonesia, hope uh, it helps. No, that really does. Thanks so much. And thanks for your, your absolute kind of openness to share with us where you are and the questions you're asking to improve the situation in Indonesia. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure the audience appreciates that as well, that the thoughts, the reflections that you're having. I'm about to hand over to Matthias, who's going to kind of draw out the, the, the key observations that he's uh, pulled out from the session. But before I do that, I just want to pick up a, a comment that's been put in the chat from Nigeria. Um, and basically, let me just get your name, Yusuf, Ag, Yusuf Agbaje, um, really pointing out that here in Nigeria, the vast majority of households and businesses have to provide their own water, either through hand up wells, boreholes or rainwater, because the public water systems have largely collapsed across the country. So some people decide to use their individual water source for drinking and other purposes, while others settle for sources like sachet and bottled water. So just a bit of an input there from the African content, continent. And just to, to say to everybody, we do have another session on self-supply, global self-supply session. Some speakers will speak again. There are also some new speakers, but that's on Thursday. And I think Tara's writing in the chat just to, to tell you about that session. If you want to attend again, you'd be very welcome. So now I'm going to hand over to you, Matthias, um, kind of from your reflections. And I'm sorry we've not got all the questions, but maybe we can pick them up on Thursday. Um, over to you. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. I'm going to just highlight a few, a few of the things that I heard. And some of them might sound basic, but I think it's, it's nevertheless worthwhile um, pointing out to them. First point is that self supplies everywhere. We heard in this session examples from the two wells in Bangladesh, but we also heard from households in Sweden and households in the United States. Actually, some of the countries with the highest rate of self supply are in Eastern Europe. So, really, the first point is self supply is everywhere in every single country that I know of. The second point is that it's big. It's much bigger than many people think. We heard of global numbers of about one in seven globally, but in Asia, it's even bigger. Um, we heard from Tim, it's about one in three. So we're talking about billion, billion people. And in that regard, it's, it's quite striking how much it has been overlooked over the last decades. Um, the book coming out this year that came out this year by Sally Sutton is the first one on self-supply. And most actors focus on centralized systems, but actually the biggest actor and the billion people are relying on self-supply globally. The, four, the third point is really that it has been overlooked and it keeps being overlooked by most actors. And my fourth point is that really how diverse it is. It can be rainwater jars in Thailand, it can be hand pumps in Bangladesh, it can be solar system with deep pumps in the United States. It really takes lots of shapes and colors around the world. And that makes it also a challenge to, to really go and, and support it because you really need to focus on the global, on, on the local context. And that brings me to a few takeaway points. The first one really is calling all people here in this session to look at self-supply, to open our eyes, to see what is happening. We have been overlooking self-supply for such a long time. And I think it's really time, especially if we talk about universal access. I'm not asking all funders to completely shift to self-supply, but to take it in the picture, to complement their traditional approaches with ways of supporting self-supply in different contexts and really focusing on the local context because self-supply is very different from one place to another. So calling on all of us, open our eyes, let's look at it, um, calling on supporters to start in including it in their strategies and in their support, not only funders, but also government actors, also NGOs, and also academia. 
that would be the main messages from my side and I'm handing back to Kirsty. Oops. I muted again. Thank you very much, Matthias. That was absolutely super. Um, we're going to be closing in literally a minute and a half. I'd just like to ask all the panelists to switch on your videos, please, so that we can wave goodbye. And, um, and to the audience, as you can see, there's a group of people who are absolutely committed, interested, want to learn about self-supply. It's not that self-supply is the only way, but as Aisha so you know, clearly pointed out, it's complementary. It links with other aspects. So please, if you're interested in the topic, contact any of us, all of us, contact Matthias, who, who chairs the, leads the RWCN group. Make contact and let's kind of keep growing this group of people who are so committed to improving people's water in ways that make sense, in ways that work um, and in fulfilling of, of human rights. So thank you everybody. And let's have a big wave as we, we say goodbye to this session. And yet there's lots of information in the chat for other resources. So a reminder there if you want to, to lead more. But thanks a lot and thanks everybody. It's been great to have this session. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kirsten. Bye-bye. Thank you.